Today is 21st October, which puts us two weeks from the initial attack by Hamas on southern Israel. Violent, brutal and unexpected as it was, which has set in train a series of events in the Middle East, the outcome of which remains unclear. In the meantime, Israeli bombing of Gaza continues. Hamas and other Palestinian groups continue to launch missile and rocket attacks on Israel. And there is a festering military confrontation between Hezbollah and the Israeli military along the Lebanese border, though so far this doesn't seem to have escalated into an outright war. American warships continue to gather in the Middle East. There are more reports of more attacks on American bases in Iraq and Syria. Again, so far, these appear to have been at a limited level. But as I spoke about yesterday in my last programme, there are also reports, unconfirmed, that Iran has been deploying long-range missiles, long-range missiles to their launch positions, suggesting that Iran is at least preparing for the possibility that it might become involved in some kind of military action. So the situation remains tense. We still have not seen an, the launch of a ground operation by Israel into Gaza, but a multitude of comments now by Israeli officials continue to suggest that such a military operation, such a ground offensive into Gaza, is indeed coming. Now, I'm going to make a few quick observations about the military situation. It's been suggested um, in the media here in Britain, and I believe in the United States, that one of the reasons why there's been a delay in launching the ground operation into Gaza is that negotiations are still underway for the release by Hamas of some of its hostages. Two were released yesterday, both apparently from Chicago, and Qatar, the Gulf state, which is widely seen and presumed to be Hamas's principal fun funder, um, apparently is playing the key mediation role. It's been suggested that Western governments have asked Israel to delay the launch of its ground offensive whilst these negotiations to release these hostages continue to be underway. Now, I understand that and I think that is perhaps an appropriate step, but I would say that if it is Hamas's intention to prevent a ground operation being launched at all, which is surely a possibility. The fact that Western governments are telling Israel to hold back from launching a ground operation until the hostages are released logically incentivizes Hamas to hold on to its hostages. Now, the fact that Hamas instead appears to be releasing hostages in return for humanitarian assistance may suggest that Hamas is not as concerned about the danger of a ground offensive as perhaps some people in Washington and Israel and elsewhere might suppose. I'm just floating this thought. I'm not privy to Hamas's internal discussions. I said in a program some days ago that I'd seen a report somewhere, and I have to say I've not been able to refine that report, so I'm relying now purely on memory. Um, but I did read in a report somewhere that some elements of Hamas supposedly had not been consulted in advance or informed in advance 
about the attack that took place last week and that there have been recriminations within Hamas about it. It could be if there really is such a split within Hamas and if such divisions do exist that more moderate voices within Hamas are also trying to find a way out of this increasingly dangerous situation and they might be looking to achieve that perhaps through Qatar by negotiating for the release of hostages. Now, that's a possibility but I have to say it's based entirely on speculation and it seems to me that it is equally plausible that Hamas is united and knows what it is doing and is in the, again making certain very fine calculations in its own self-interest. Anyway, I just wanted to discuss those points because it did occur to me as interesting that two hostages yesterday were released. Now, allegedly, Hamas has got an agreement for the supply of um, humanitarian assistance into Gaza, and it's good to say that the crossing point between one of the crossing points between Egypt and Gaza was finally opened yesterday. President Biden gave the impression earlier that he'd already secured agreement to have it reopened. But as I said in my program yesterday, it actually happened several hours after he was supposed to have brokered that agreement. And whatever mediation he may have done in connection to it might not have been the reason, the actual reason why that crossing point was opened. But anyway, a crossing point was opened and humanitarian relief supplies, limited in quantity and not remotely to the level required by the catastrophic situation the catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza, but at any rate, some humanitarian supplies have indeed been provided to Gaza over the last few hours. Now, again, I've noticed that no one, perhaps understandably, is making a direct connection with the release of the hostages, the two hostages. Nobody's saying that these relief supplies were allowed into Gaza uh, in return for the release of the hostages. And I don't know personally that there is such a connection. But again, it has to be a possibility. And it is again one that I just leave out there. Um, those who have more access to information about the situation than me can either confirm or refute it. But anyway, that's the situation at the moment on the ground. Incredible tension, massive mobilization of Israeli troops, lots of extremely strong statements from Israel. Now, that is hardly adequate to describe the language that is coming out of Israel for the moment. I've discussed in previous programs my very deep concern about the nature of some of the language. And I said that in the event that war crimes were to take place over and above the violations of international humanitarian law, which in my opinion and in the opinion of many jurists, have already taken place. If there were such war crimes, and if those war crimes did result in prosecutions, then this language that we are hearing, and I use the present tense, potentially becomes evidence in those prosecutions. And again, I want to reiterate that fact. I think it is one that people have a tendency to ignore. But anyway, the rhetoric remains 
unbelievably strong. There's no sign of it moderating. And if for what it's worth, I don't get any sense that the bombing and the missile strikes are moderating either. On the contrary, they seem to be continuing with the same level of intensity as always. And of course, as I discussed yesterday in my programme, we had complex manoeuvres in the UN Security Council. First, one draft resolution calling for a ceasefire coming from the Russians, followed almost immediately by a second draft resolution calling for a ceasefire drafted and proposed by the Brazilians. I said already that it's obvious to me that there was collusion or cooperation, if you prefer, between the Russians and the Brazilians in this sudden flurry of draft resolutions that we saw. But anyway, the United States vetoed the Brazilian resolution and previously the Russian resolution did not find sufficient support. And for the moment, diplomatic moves in the Security Council remain in abeyance. I doubt that that will be the case for very much longer. As the humanitarian situation in Gaza continues to deteriorate, and despite the small amount of relief supplies that have entered Gaza, which, as I've said, are nowhere near adequate to addressing the humanitarian crisis that is developing there. Well, notwithstanding that, even if there is no ground invasion, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza will deepen and intensify and start to do so rapidly as supplies of food and water run out. That is inevitably going to have a major global impact. And of course, if Israel does launch its ground offensive, which again is looking increasingly likely, well, that will escalate demands for a ceasefire and will almost certainly lead to further moves in the United Nations, in the Security Council, um, also. Now, before I proceed, I will say that I've had some extremely valuable um, emails, incredibly informative emails, from two uh, from various military people, but two in particular. Both I would regard as outstanding sources, and both are deeply experienced in military matters. Both have written extensively about these things, both in private and in public, and I'm not going to say more because I don't want to say anything that would give away any indication of who these people are. Anyway, suffice to say this, in the case of one, he has discussed at very great length and in immense detail the complexities of fighting in an urban environment. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank this person. I have found this a most informative email indeed, and it is certainly going to help me understand better what might come in the next few weeks, assuming that a ground offensive does occur. The second email, in fact, from this other correspondent, there's been a flurry of emails about various matters, about the availability, for example, of JDAM's bombs um, for the Israeli Air Force. Very interesting, very important information. But this person has also made some important observations about Hamas fighters. And can I say again, um, this person is someone who undoubtedly does know what he's talking about. Now, he's observed these fighters in action. Obviously, this is based on films. And principally, it is based on the films. I mean, this, I presume, 
that Hamas itself has provided. Anyway, this person is, shall we say, unimpressed by what he has seen. He's seen these fighters in action, he's seen how they operate, and he takes the view that training levels are certainly substandard by his reckoning. And whilst these might be perhaps determined and fierce fighters, they're, no, they're not remotely up to the level of competence that might be expected of professionally trained troops. And in discussing the Israeli army, this person has made a number of very pertinent observations. He has acknowledged that the bulk of the Israeli military consists of reservists, that their level of training is perhaps less than adequate also, but he does make the point that alongside these reservists, Israel does have a cadre of tough, well-trained, professional military who would certainly be better trained, very significantly better trained than the Hamas fighters that this person has observed in action in the various films and videos which he has seen. Now, why is this important? Well, it is important because, of course, in discussing my concerns, my straightforwardly expressed concerns, which, by the way, I noticed were um, repeated by someone, Jonathan Friedland, a commentator on The Guardian, with whom I'm in disagreement, by the way, on most matters, that's putting it gently. Anyway, I noticed that he, who is, of course, a strong supporter of Israel, um, though very much on the liberal side of Israeli politics, anyway, he too is worried, as I, he too is worried, he's too expressed concerns that Israel is making decisions in anger and is being lured into a trap in Gaza, a trap of prolonged and very difficult street fighting. Anyway, um, coming back to the main point, um, all of this is predicated on the assumption that Hamas fighters have at least a sufficient level of training, organization, and motivation to make a prolonged and effective fight of it if the Israeli military does move in. Now, I think that it would be overstating things that this correspondent of mine has said if I were to say that his email casts doubt on that, that he thinks that these fighters might not be able to put up resistance to the Israelis. I don't think he does actually say that. He says that the balance in favor of Israel might be higher than I'm estimating. But anyway, this is a professional view from someone. He's looked at these, the film of these fighters in action and certainly he doesn't think that they're invincible <laughs> let me put it in that way now of course and one has to make always caveats on this this is based upon observation of videos we don't know how representative of hamas fighters these videos are it could be that just as the israelis have a trained and tough professional cadre of soldiers Hamas has a tough professional cadre of fighters who have not been filmed in videos up to this point. But anyway, this is important information. It is again going to um, help me understand what is going to happen over the next few weeks. And I want to take this opportunity again 
to thank this person for this information which he has provided with, by the way, a notable lack of bias and with the professional objectivity which I would, ex which I would expect from him. So, thanks to him also. Anyway, let me move on. So, we'll see what happens over the next weeks, few weeks, whether there is this invasion, if you like, or advance into Gaza, and what the outcome will be. But, again, if there is a military incursion by the Israeli military into Gaza, if it does indeed run into problems, if it does become a grinding battle lasting weeks and months, well, once more, the political calculus, the international political calculus, is going to start to weigh in and is going to have to start to have an effect. Now, there is a view which is being widely expressed by many people, by many commentators, in fact, that what world opinion thinks isn't going to matter, that Israel is past caring by now about what the world thinks, that it has decided upon its chosen course of action, and that obviously it has the backing of the current administration in the United States. And by the way, if this administration is to be voted out, is voted out next year and replaced by a Republican administration, then that is likely to be even more supportive of Israel than the current one. So that all of this means that Israel can simply disregard any comments, any observations made by any third parties and can push ahead and do what it likes. And beyond that, I have been reading in many places, in open sources, in the mainstream media, but by the way also in emails which have been addressed to me, observations by people who are on both sides, by Israelis and Palestinians, and by their supporters, who both make clear to me that for each of these sides, this is now a matter that brooks for no compromise. And it's based very much, and I have to say this, on perceptions of history, recent history, a belief on each side that it is a matter now of survival, survival in the rawest most basic sense, physical survival of the respective nations, that Israel sees this attack by Hamas, or many people in Israel and in the Jewish community worldwide see this attack by Hamas, not so much as a political act, but rather as an expression of hostility to Jews, generally, and a desire to destroy them. And on the part of Palestinians, that it is seen this, that these events are interpreted as part of a desire by Israel to drive all Palestinians out of the entire territory of historic Palestine, to displace them entirely in effect, destroy them as a nation so that Israel can be established across the entire territory once and for all. And these narratives do exist. And I have to say that there is, one cannot say that these historical narratives are ungrounded. There has been a long history of persecution and hostility to the Jewish people, culminating in the events of the Holocaust 
in the 1940s. And these, of course, shape understanding of events by Jewish people today. And, of course, on the part of Palestinians, there has been massive displacement of the, their populations from Palestine, a thwarting of their desire for self-determination as a nation and as a people, the establishment of an independent state on their own territory. And this, of course, is feeding in to their fears about what the intentions, not just of Israel, but of the Western powers towards them also are. And there is no doubt at all that these fears have been heightened by recent events on both sides, and they are making, they're making each side more intransigent, and at the same time, are making them more heedless about ignoring global opinion and violating international humanitarian law. Um, if one believes that it is one's survival that is at stake, then it becomes understandable. Now, I'm going to say that in my opinion this is wrong. I think that this is a misunderstanding of the crisis and that the nature of the crisis is such that international opinion cannot be ignored and nor can humanitarian law. And I say that because, and I'm going to speak now specifically about the case of Israel, but with Palestinians there are things one can also say and I will no doubt return to them um, sooner or later. But with the case of Israel, it might have been given carte blanche by the United States to do what it believes it must do. But of course, the United States is itself only one country, however powerful, and the United States also has international interests in and concerns which cannot simply be disregarded. If the United States senses that there is a collapse, a real risk of a collapse of its international position, if it sees more and more of its friends turning away from it, if it senses that its overall position globally is at risk, then even the most hardline administration in Washington is likely eventually to adjust to that reality. And until recently, perhaps the United States was powerful enough in the world to withstand pressure like that to a great extent. But today, in a situation of intensified geopolitical competition with China and Russia in combination at least able, able at least to equal the aggregate power and influence of the United States and possibly in some places even exceed it, it would be unwise to assume <laughs> that the United States can simply disregard international complaints and pressure as it could in the past. And those international complaints and pressure are growing and they're growing all the time and they can be found in increasing numbers of places. Earlier today, I received a message from um, pointing out to me a recent statement that has been made by the ASEAN states. These are states, the, 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 it's an ASEAN bloc. It's, uh, it consists of many of the most powerful states within um, Asia, states that the United States 
wants to have as friends in its competition with China and which it has been actively courting. Well, this is what the ASEAN statement says. We, the member states of the Association of South Asia, Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, are gravely concerned over the recent escalation of armed conflicts in the Middle East. We urge for the immediate end of violence, in other words, for a ceasefire, to avoid further humanitarian casualties, and that must be specifically in Gaza, because that is where the uh, primary number of human casualties now are, and call for the full respect of international humanitarian law. We call on all parties to create safe, rapid and unimpeded acts, passage of humanitarian corridors. And again, that has to be addressed primarily to Israel about allowing humanitarian relief supplies into Gaza. And then the statement goes on to read, it's a second paragraph. We strongly condemn the acts of violence which have led to the deaths and injuries of civilians, including ASEAN nationals. And that might, by the way, extend to some of the people that Hamas killed in South, in South Israel at the time of its initial attack. We reaffirm our support for a negotiated two-state solution that allows both Israelis and Palestinians to live side by side in peace and security, consistent with relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions. And the Russians have been talking about these Security Council resolutions. The Chinese have been talking about these Security Council resolutions. And we see that the ASEAN states, which include states that have been historically friendly to the United States, like, say, Singapore, or Malaysia, lining up and saying the same thing. And then the statement goes on to say this will be the only viable path to resolving the root cause of the conflict. And that again mirrors Chinese and Russian language. So the United States, which is courting the ASEAN states, Recently, President Biden made a trip to Vietnam, which is one of the most powerful and largest ASEAN states and the one with the fastest growing economy. Anyway, he visited Vietnam. Vietnam is a country he and the United States have been anxious to win over to their side in connection with the US's current competition with China. And Vietnam has signed up to this agreement, to this statement, and there's no reason to think that Vietnam is in any basic disagreement with any part of this statement or that it sees this statement as some kind of formality. So we can see that that pressure is going to grow and if the United States simply ignores it. It is going to eventually start to have an impact on the United States' global position. This is understood by many people within the US government. There are now increasing rumors that this internal rebellion within the State Department against the current policy of the, the administration is growing. That more and more State Department officials are talking to each other and saying that the unequivocal support for Israel, or at least for the Netanyahu government, expressed by the United States, is contrary to US interests. I dealt with that article, I discussed that article in the Financial Times, which spoke about how um, the situation 
the position that the United States has been taking and the Europeans have been taking with respect to this crisis is undermining further international support for the US and the European stance on Ukraine. But of course, it extends to many other issues as well. Anyway, there are growing doubts and unease within the State Department as well. And though there's been talk of a letter, which we haven't yet seen, and which, for all I know, may never come, the fact that these rumours exist and are circulating suggests that there is indeed growing unrest within the, dip the US's own diplomatic cadre about the direction that events are taking. And what we know about the United States is even more true of Europe. It is openly reported in the mainstream media in Europe that several EU states were deeply unhappy by the actions of EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen travelling to Israel, appearing to give Israel unqualified support, doing so without first getting a mandate from the EU, the EU states, speaking in other words without first consulting them and with it before a global, uh, a, a united position was reached. And if this crisis continues, if it's prolonged, if there is a humanitarian disaster in Gaza and if there is a ground operation which drags on with pictures every day of more buildings destroyed, more people killed, more ambulance sirens blaring, more people being taken into those ambulances. If reports continue to spread of shortages of urgent medicines, of water shortages, all those kind of things, well, all that opinion will intensify and will grow. <laughs> and it will the dissent will grow not just amongst officials where it is at the moment perhaps most strongly expressed, at least in the United States, it will start to spread increasingly and unavoidably to the European public, which now has um, amongst its midst millions of people who've come to live in Europe and who have Islamic who are of Islamic faith and who are naturally predisposed to sympathize with the Palestinians and who for whom the status of the Al-Aqsa Mosque is as important as it is for Muslims everywhere. Anyway, pressure for them from them and also from many other people within Europe, people who are not of that background, but who do not want to see a humanitarian crisis, is going to grow also. And sooner or later, inevitably, it is going to be impossible to hold the line. The most determined government in the United States, the most resolute in support of Israel, is eventually going to find that the political costs of sticking to a policy in which Israel is launching attacks on Gaza and imposing an on blockade on Gaza and is looking to resolve this matter in the way that some people in Israel have been saying unilaterally in any event. The point is going to come, it will inevitably come provided this conflict is prolonged, when even the will of the United States is going to break, and at that point, the inevitable resolution, part drafted undoubtedly by the Russians, backed by the Chinese, backed by the Arab states and the Muslim states, will go to the Security Council 
or to the United Nations General Assembly, and the United States will feel unable to veto it or to block it, at which point it will pass and Israel will find itself under overwhelming pressure, not just from its adversaries, but from most of its friends, to submit to the will of the global community. That is the way these things evolve, always provided, as I said, that Hamas is able to prolong this thing and is able to keep fighting and is able to prevent Israel from achieving whatever military objective Israel is, has set itself. And this, by the way, will happen, uh, and this scenario that I've outlined, will happen also, even if there is no wider war. Of course, if there is a wider war, if Iran and other countries start to become involved, then the moment that resolution is placed before the Security Council will be the moment that happens, that will happen much sooner than it would have happened in this rather more prolonged scenario that I've just that I've just outlined. So that is the reality. And um, I understand that this is perhaps one that some people in Israel, in the Israeli government, are resisting. But they should be aware of it, and it should inform their decisions. I should say that some proposals that are coming out of Israel or the United States, I'm not sure which, also seem to me to be completely unrealistic. Now, I was reading somewhere in the American media, I forget where, um, that there's now a proposal that once Israel has moved into Gaza and defeated and destroyed Hamas, which of course has not yet happened and might not prove so easy, we'll just have to wait and see, but once that is done, Israel and the United States will have to work together to establish an alternative government for Gaza, which is not controlled by Hamas anymore. Now, in a sense, the fact that they're talking about that like that, that might be a positive sign in, it, in the sense that it might imply that they're no longer seriously contemplating the entire displace, displacement of the entire population of Gaza, which some of the rhetoric from Israel at one point certainly suggested. On the other hand, it is a very bad idea indeed. It, it, it looks like the United States and Israel deciding between them who should govern the Palestinians. It is, in other words, an outcome that the Palestinians themselves will see and much of the rest of the world will also see as colonial or colonialist in its character. Far from quelling resistance, that it seems to me is more likely over time to provoke it. If this government that the Americans and the Israelis supposedly are thinking of establishing in Gaza runs into prolonged opposition from the people of Gaza who see it as an American and or Israeli stooge, what do the Americans and the Israelis do? Do they enter Gaza again and come to this government's rescue? Or do they stay outside and let this government collapse and let it, let it be replaced either by a revived Hamas or by some other organization, even more hardline if that is possible, than Hamas itself? This is an intractable problem. It is not one that is 
easily solved. If it had been, the Israelis and the Americans would have come up with that answer, that the answer to solve it long ago. One can't simply impose solutions in a problem like this. One has to work with others, including the Palestinian community, to try to find a solution that is long-term and sustainable. There is ultimately no other sustainable course. And coming back to those fears which exist on both sides, that this is now a struggle for their survival, their respective survival. I would say that to me, that looks very much like a council of despair, one which, in the case of Israel, would lock Israel into a situation of permanent crisis and insecurity, and one which, in the case of the Palestinians, it seems to me, would do exactly the same. And as I never see saying, despair is a bad counsellor and produces bad outcomes. Now, all of this leads me to what other things are going on. And there is, at the moment, a major conference underway in Egypt, or at least there has been. Uh, it's been all but ignored in the Western media, which I find concerning. It's dubbed the Cairo Summit for Peace, and it is apparently looking for ways to de-escalate the war, the current conflict. And though this has not been absolutely confirmed, my impression is that there's been talk about setting up this um, conference for some time, and it may just be coincidence that it is, it is taking place even as these events in Gaza are um, taking their course. And there's a long piece about it in Al from Al, Al Jazeera, and it says that it's dubbed the Cairo Summit for Peace, Representatives from countries including Jordan, France, Germany, Russia, China, the United Kingdom, the United States, Qatar and South Africa are attending. And it's a one day meeting and it's taking place today. And the United Nations and EU officials are also present. And then we see that the meeting has been addressed by the Egyptian president, Abdel Fattah, El Sisi, and he, according to Al Jazeera, invited leaders to come to an agreement for a roadmap to end the humanitarian catastrophe in the Gaza Strip and revive a path to peace between Israel and the Palestinians. The plan's goals include the delivery of aid to Gaza and agreeing to a ceasefire followed by negotiations leading to a two-state solution. Now, Hold on to that. Al Sisi is now giving us a clue as to what the shape of the eventual UN Security Council resolution is going to be. It's going to call for the delivery of aid to Gaza. It's going to call for a ceasefire. Obviously, the release of hostages is something we can be certain will be there. But apparently, the resolution, when it comes, it's going, is going to call for the immediate convening of negotiations, leading to a two-state solution. And we also, further on in the article, learn that on Wednesday, Egypt also called for the international for an international conference to discuss the developments and future of the Palestinian cause. And Al Jazeera tells us Foreign Minister Egyptian Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri said the meeting would seek an international concurrence on the need for de-escalation and humanitarian aid deliveries to the Gaza Strip. So 
an international conference. And it is surely not a coincidence that last week, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi was talking about that very thing in that rather tense conversation he had with US Secretary of State Tony Blinken. We can see that the ideas, the idea of an international conference is now circulating. And we don't know where it originated. I suspect it did originate from China. But anyway, putting that aside, the, the Egyptians have now also picked up on it and are now running with it. And we also see that um, other senior Arab leaders are also attending the summit. And one of them is King Abdullah of Jordan, a staunch ally of the United States. And Al Jazeera quotes him saying the following, all civilian lives matter. The relentless bombing campaign underway in Gaza as we speak is cruel and unconscionable on every level. It is collective punishment of a besieged and helpless people. It is a flagrant violation of international humanitarian law. It is a war crime anywhere else attacking civilian infrastructure and deliberately starving an entire population of food, water, electricity and basic necessities would be condemned. Accountability would inf be enforced, but not in Gaza. And those are the words, as I said, of one of America's staunchest allies in the Middle East, King Abdullah of Jordan. And um, I've seen that another Saudi prince, Prince Tukri, who was, I believe, formerly a prominent diplomat, he's been rather more circumspect and measured in his language. He's added to these criticisms of Israel because King Abdullah's words are obviously directed at Israel. King Prince Tukri has also made strong criticisms of Hamas. But he's also echoed many of these criticisms effectively of Israel that we have, and by extension, by the way, also the United States, which we see King Abdullah also making. So this is a conference. Apparently, Israel is not represented. They've not sent a representative, which is unsurprising. And the representative who is there from the United States is apparently a middle-ranking official, not someone that is taken especially seriously. By the way, that was a serious mistake, in my opinion. Yet again, it would have been far more wise and appropriate for the United States to send one of its top people to attend the summit. After all, President Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, has been attending similar types of peace summits concerning the conflict in Ukraine, peace summits from which the Russians have been excluded. New one is supposed to happen fairly soon in Malta, by the way. Why can he not attend a summit like this on the issue of Gaza in Cairo? Again, the absence of such an important official or, or of an important official from the United States at this meeting in Gaza will be noticed in the Middle East. Anyway, the point is that we can see that the head of steam is building up. The Israelis weren't there. The Americans weren't there. But we can see that moves are underway towards an in a plan for the way forward. And we saw also from that statement by ASEAN that international opinion is crystallizing behind it. The United States suffered a humiliating reverse at the Security Council when it was isolated in its decision to vote against and veto 
the Brazilian draft resolution. Now, the Russian ambassador to the UN, Dmitry Polyansky, or I should say deputy ambassador to the UN, Dmitry Polyansky, has now been messaging that the United States stabbed its friends in the back. It had said when it opposed the Russian resolution, the Russian draft resolution on the previous day, that it was opposing it because it contained, contained no criticism of Hamas. The US's friends, therefore, assumed that it would support a similar resolution which did condemn Hamas. Now, the, in fact, the United States did the opposite. It vetoed the resolution, even when it condemned Hamas. The Russians are already saying that the US's friends feel betrayed and feel that they've been stabbed in the back. And even if they, ha they don't actually feel that, we can be certain that people like Polyansky and his boss, Russia's ambassador to the UN, the rather formidable Vasily Nebenzia, are now working the phones and meeting the other ambassadors and are telling them that they should feel betrayed and stabbed in the back because of the way in which the US behaved. And it won't just be the Russians. The Brazilians will be there saying it as well. So will the Chinese. So, of course, will other ambassadors from other countries and the Egyptians and the Jordanians and the Saudis and all of the others will be working and huddling together and working, as I said, towards that ceasefire resolution, which is going, which is, will eventually come and which will call when it does come for a ceasefire, the opening of humanitarian corridors, the lifting of the blockade, the release of the hostages, and for immediate negotiations to resolve the crisis conducted within the framework of an international conference. I am going to say that, in my opinion, the early drafts of this resolution almost certainly are being worked on, even as we speak, probably in the foreign ministries in Beijing and Moscow, and for all I know, in other capitals as well. So, that is the crisis at the moment. We will see whether the Israelis do advance into Gaza. We will see where this crisis goes. The urgent thing at the moment is to prevent this conflict escalating, to avoid situations where the fighting in Gaza spreads to other places. If Israeli troops do enter Gaza and fighting begins, and especially if that fighting continues for a long time, and if pictures, as I said, circulate across the Middle East, which show civilians being killed and injured, then the prospects of the fighting spreading will grow and grow steadily. There'll be more attacks on isolated American garrisons across the Middle East. Sooner or later, American soldiers will risk experiencing fatalities and then, as I said, we could see an even greater and more disastrous turn in the crisis. And pressure for that resolution in the Security Council increasing and it be being brought forward even sooner than I expect. Now, all of this is happening because Israel and the United States are not looking at this problem in a political way. 
they're looking at this problem purely in military terms as something that can be resolved through some kind of military operation when that is probably beyond their power to do in the absence of ideas coming from them we can see that the ideas to resolve this crisis are coming from others and that if this resolution is passed and does carry the Russians and the Chinese will have achieved their objective which is to oust the United States from its leading position in the diplomatic efforts to resolve this crisis which it has enjoyed for the past 45 or so years. So that's where we are with this crisis at the moment. Let me say again, I think the United States has made a major mistake, one mistake, one further mistake, in ignoring the summit in Cairo. I know that there are some people who think that these summits are just talking shops, that the people who attend them just bloviate and that they don't result in anything. I think that when they happen in conjunction with the events that we are seeing in Gaza, that is a complacent view. Anyway, that's where we are about the situation in the Middle East. It is becoming increasingly difficult to give the conflict in Ukraine the time and attention that it deserves. I would say that there is now growing alarm in especially European capitals, but I also suspect in Washington, that the competing demands in terms of time, funding, and above all weapons that are coming from the conflict in the Middle East will affect however much the administration and some European governments want otherwise, it will affect Western support for Ukraine. There are only so many shells, 155 millimeter shells, after all, and if Israel is going to lead, need them in large quantities, by definition, there are going to be fewer for Ukraine. And yesterday, I saw the first report that um, artillery use by Ukraine over the last couple of hours has declined further still because presumably Ukraine is having to husband ammunition even more as supplies of ammunition dwindle. And a number of commentators have pointed out that even if President Biden does get the $60 billion for Ukraine for the whole of this year that he's asking for in and which he spoke about in that address, that Oval Office address that I talked about um, yesterday, um, even if he does get that, that will still mean <laughs> that the amount of funding that Ukraine will receive over the course of the next year will be less than it was over the preceding year. And in terms of funding going into Ukraine's economy, the reduction will be substantial by around 20%, with Europe now deep in economic uncertainty and probably recession unable to make up the difference. And there's already been an alarmed statement coming from the EU and the US about the real danger that the Ukrainian economy might actually collapse. So we can see that the pressure is on, apparently blaming the Russians for wanting to collapse the economy, but there we go, that does seem to be the situation. The EU, presumably in order to um, show its resolve, is apparently now working on its 12th package of anti-Russian sanctions. 
Apparently amongst the items which it will no longer be permitted to export to Russia will be buttons, which again, I find most bizarre. But anyway, that is what is being said. And that again su suggests the extent to which momentum is now being lost. And in the meantime, articles are starting to appear, including one by Max Hastings in The Times, The London Times, which talk about the fact that um, support for Ukraine is waning, that Western publics are becoming tired and even bored by the conflict in Ukraine, and that the des desire to continue to support Ukraine across the West is melting away, especially as economic problems mount and as attention per force is redirected or refocused to events in the Middle East. And yesterday in my program, I mentioned how two people with great knowledge of this crisis also pointed out to me that if the crisis in the Middle East is prolonged and leads to protest and dissent in Europe, that might also open the way for more people to challenge and to dissent and protest against government policies with respect to Ukraine as well. So anyway, that's, that's um, concerns that Western governments are expressing. But what about the actual state of the war? Well, yesterday we witnessed another big Russian missile and um, drone offensive across Ukraine. These have become so routine that it's now almost sterile to actually discuss all the various targets that they do um, that they do destroy, that the Russians claim at least that they have destroyed or attacked. But the Russian Defense Ministry did provide some really very remarkable information about what it says is the situation with respect to the Ukrainian Air Force. And they claimed that in the period, the week between the week from 14th to 20th October, no fewer than 12 Ukrainian aircraft were shot down, 10 MiG-29 fighter jets, and two Sukhoi-25 ground attack aircraft, and that two MI-8 helicopters, Ukrainian MI-8 helicopters, were also shot down, with no analogous losses suffered by the Russian Air Force. And the Russians have also claimed that seven of those 10 MiG-29s were destroyed over the course of a single day. Now, I don't know whether or not that is true, but if that is true, then that was a disastrous day for the Ukrainian Air Force. It's already been severely weakened over the course of this war, but losses on that scale over the course of a single day suggest that either there's been some change in Russian tactics or that the reach of the Russian Air Force is getting longer and that the Russians therefore are able to shoot down more Ukrainian aircraft than they have been able to previously. Now, of course, it could be that the Russians are just making all this up or maybe not making it up, but that they've added things wrong and that would be normal and commonplace in war. However, I've tended to notice in the past that when the Russians do make claims of material losses of aircraft and tanks and such things, which they say they've inflicted upon the Ukrainians. Subsequent information 
tends to corroborate those claims and to show that they are true. So perhaps it is indeed the, the case that the last week has indeed been disastrous for the Ukrainian Air Force. Now, I said that the Ukrainians, that the Russians had made a very heavy missile attack and drone attack across Ukraine. There's also um, reports coming, by the way, again, overwhelmingly from the Russian side that yesterday witnessed what might have been the single biggest missile and drone attack by Ukraine on Crimea. And apparently huge numbers of Ukrainian missiles and drones were launched towards Crimea. I'm not entirely sure exactly how many, but I understand some reports seem to suggest it's, you know, a score or even more. But the Russians claim that none actually got through, that the Russians were successful in shooting down every single missile that the Ukrainians launched against Crimea. Now, the Russians don't identify what missiles were used, except for the fact that they say that some of them were converted S-200 air defense missiles, which the Ukrainians have converted to a land attack role. But presumably, some of them did include storm shadows. There's no word that attackers missiles were part of this big attack, but whatever, a big attack, the Russians say, did take place, and the Russians also say that they repelled it, and there is a mood of buoyancy from the Russians following this. Well, that was one event. There have been others. Um, there have been others. Um, Jan Gagin, uh, who is Denis Bushilin's advisor, continues to insist that the Russians are advancing all across the front lines and are making real progress. Um, there, were, uh, there were, as a matter of fact, contrary reports to this, which said that it was in fact the Ukrainians who had intensified attacks in the Robotino Verbovoye area. If so, it's clear that they achieved no breakthroughs, and there's also some speculation by the Russians that those intensified Ukrainian attacks on the Robotino Verbovoye area were intended to divert Russian troops away from the fighting in Avdeevka. And there continues to be something of an intrigue about what is happening um, on the east bank of the Dnieper in Kherson region. But to the best estimate that I can work out, it seems that the Russians have driven the Ukrainians out of all the villages that the Ukrainians had attempted to capture when they sent small groups of men across the river. Um, but the Ukrainians have now been bottled up in one particular village um, whose name I think is Kyrkie. I'm probably get, getting that wrong. That's, maps seem to show that it is literally almost on the banks of the river. But apparently the Ukrainian troops who are said to number one or perhaps two platoons, so we're talking about maybe 30 to 60 men, are basically holed up in this village and there's firefights between them and the Russians going on and in the meantime there are artillery exchanges. But the suggestion is that the fighting in this area has um, become more complex because of increasingly difficult weather conditions that's making it more difficult for the Russians to gain drone footage of where these Ukrainian soldiers exactly are. But at the same time, it's also making it more difficult for the Ukrainians to send reinforcements and supplies across.
Anyway, as I said, this is a somewhat uncertain story. The fog of war here is particularly dense. But I don't get the sense that the Russians are in any way seriously concerned about this particular fighting. The focus continues to be Avdeevka. Russian reports still speak of their troops advancing. There's suggestions that they've either occupied this waste heap or area, whatever it is, or that this area is now in the grey zone and is being contested, which is probably true. But I also saw today reports, or perhaps I should call them confirmation, that in this heavily fortified area, the Russians are also now building tunnels um, in order to undermine the foundations of some of these defences and perhaps circumvent them in some way. And this is unsurprising. It has happened in many wars. We see that Hamas has created a network of tunnels in Gaza, so tunneling is by no means an unusual tactic in war. And of course the Russians are able to do this rapidly and on a big scale because they are extremely familiar with tunneling and they have all the tunneling equipment that one could possibly need. Russia is a major producer, if I can put it that way, of metro systems. The Moscow metro is a colossal operation and many Russian cities have metros as well and of course they have all the equipment and all of the engineers they need to build tunnels and to build them quickly if that is what they intend to do and it makes entirely logical sense if they are doing it in Avdevka that they should do it and I suspect that they will do it quickly and effectively as well and I need hardly add that by contrast, I doubt that the Ukrainians can deploy anything more than a fraction of the resources to counter tunneling, if that would be the right word, that the Russians can to whatever tunnels they themselves are going to be building. So this battle for Avdeevka continues. It seems to be the most important and intense battle at the moment. There is always the possibility that the Russians could attack somewhere else. There are also reports that they continue to clear Kupiansk, or rather the area around Kupiansk, of the various fortified positions that the Ukrainians have create, built for themselves near to that particular town. But there are also reports that further north, near Sumy, the town of Sumy, on the Ukrainian-Russian border. The Russian artillery was very active and that large parts of this area were heavily shelled by the Russians. And again, one wonders why. There have been many Russian incursions into Ukraine in this area over the last few months. And there's said to be a very big concentration of Russian troops there. And one wonders what, if anything, these troops are supposed to do. But anyway, lots of mysteries about what is going to happen. The Russians always keeping things very quietly to themselves. But the fighting continues in Avdeevka and it continues in a very intense way. Now, I would say that there are many comparisons being made between the fighting in Avdeevka and the fighting in Bakhmut last year and in the early part of this year. And certainly in terms of the intensity of artillery fire and of bomb strikes, the two battles are comparable. The Russians are bringing down probably as heavy a deluge of shells on Ukrainian positions around Avdeevka as they did around Bakhmut and I suspect the bombing is probably greater. 
But in other respects, it does seem to me as if the fighting is different, that the Russians are approaching this particular battle, the battle or siege of, of Deivka, in a much more methodical and systematic way than they did in the case of the Battle of Bakhmut. We see this with the reports about tunneling, the methodical way in which the Russians appear to be moving. It does seem to me that we see a much more sophisticated and well-resourced operation taking place than the one we saw in Bachmann. Anyway, that remains the focus of the war in Ukraine. Let me reiterate again that everybody on the Russian side assumes that this battle will take a long time, despite the fact that the gap between the two pincers that are gradually enveloping Avdeevka is said to be only eight to nine kilometers wide. Well, that is the point where I'm going to end my program today. I expect that before long, um, I'm going to be returning in more detail to events in Ukraine. They remain as complex and as important as always, even if the present focus is indeed on the Middle East. But anyway, this is where I finish today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, uh, Locals, Rumble and X. You can uh, support our work via Patreon and Subscribe Star. Links under this video. You can go to our shop and get yourself the magic mugs and hats and hoodies and t-shirts and all those great things that you will find there. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.